It's pretty intimidating for a, a for an Ontario farm boy to be out there saying, "Holy mackerel! I'm just about at the tip of North America, the mainland North America, and uh, all everything rests on this one big old round engine." Welcome to Flying BC, a podcast about the people, planes, and aviation adventures in British Columbia and Canada, with your host Warwick Patterson. Well, it's been a while since the last episode, but thanks to everyone who keeps coming back for new shows. Starting the new year, I'll be releasing new episodes every two weeks and have some great guests and topics coming down the pipe. On this episode, I talk with Tim Cole, who takes us on a journey through his career, starting in the 60s at the legendary Bush operation, Laurentian Air Services, all the way through to his various roles in Transport Canada on the West Coast, and his flying adventures post-retirement in his 172. His career is a great example of the sort of interesting and fulfilling jobs you can find as a pilot. With over 13,000 hours in his logbook, half of which is on floats, skis, and in the bush, Tim has a treasure trove of stories, and he's published a lot of them in his new memoir, Tight Floats and Tailwinds. I'll post the link to where you can buy the book on the BCGA store in the show notes. It's well worth a read. So fire up the preheater, pump your floats, and settle in for this discussion with Tim Cole. It's hard to know where to start with this discussion because, uh, yeah, you have so many stories and a long storied career. But I guess let's go back to the beginning. Um, we'll we'll kind of cherry pick a few storylines in here. But the year is 1966, and you just get your CPL, and then you start working for a pretty legendary bush operation. Okay, I might even I might even walk it back a little more than that. Uh, I was raised on a farm in the Ottawa area, uh, two farms, one uh, in the uh, in the west end of Ottawa and then a little further out to the west in the Stittsville area. Um, uh, I learned to fly uh, in uh, in 64 at uh, Bradley Air Services at, uh, at CARP uh, and did a few pickup jobs for them uh, before uh, I got my commercial license as you say, in 66, and uh, my first real job was in 67, was on uh, fire patrol in Western Quebec, uh, flying 172s uh, on uh, on floats. Um, uh, Laurentian Air Services was one of the uh, was one of the early companies and uh, commercial companies in Canada, um, and. Uh, it was started by Barnett McLaren and Walter Deesher at uh, what was called Lindy's Field, which uh, is now the Ottawa Airport, the McDonald Cartier uh, Airport, uh, which Laurentian actually owned the airport for a short while. And they sold it to the DOT, so they had a long-term lease on it that, uh, uh, that went on for uh, for many years in a prime location. Um, uh, I flew for. Uh, uh, I flew for them. Um, we can also step back a little bit uh, where I am right now uh, is is that uh, I've been flying for 55 years. Um, I still hold an airline transport uh, uh, license uh, rating for fixed wing, commercial helicopter license for uh, for rotary wing. Um, running just shy of 13,000 hours. Uh, about uh, half of that time is on floats and boats and uh, skis and uh, a lot of uh, a lot of time in, in remote places and all that sort of stuff. But uh, I also did the uh, uh, did uh, you know King Air's corporate uh, that corporate type stuff and whatnot as well. So I'm I'm still active pilot. Uh, I have a Cessna that I keep at uh, at uh, Langley and uh, I. Fly it as much as I can. Right now, in COVID times, it's about once a week. But uh, um, it, I try and get uh, at least one big trip in a year. Uh, I, I like to go more than uh, than just to the uh, uh, just up the valley for uh, for a piece of pie. Although I do that too. Uh, I have a sister-in-law in the Caribou, and I do a fair amount of flying up to the uh, up to the Caribou. 
going back now to Laurentian Air Services and, and Ottawa, uh, they um, uh, they started up uh, uh, bar they were started up they had timber limits in, uh, in Western Quebec and they were servicing the, the timber industry but then they also started up aerial tourism and that goes back into the into the 30s uh, and that was still a large part of their uh, their business. I started out uh, on fire patrol, uh, went through into uh, into uh, uh, beavers and, uh, and and otters and turbo beavers and DC three and cubs and Cessnas and beach eighteen. <laughs> no, I didn't do too much on the beach eighteen. Uh, did uh, uh, I, I did the uh, did the goose and the uh, and the and the turtle beaver. Uh, mm. I, I worked alongside the Beach 18 a lot. It was a, it was a great airplane. From Laurentian Air Services, uh, uh, at a fairly early age, uh, they made me chief pilot. Uh, and uh, I was only 26 years old, and uh, uh, we were running about uh, 20 airplanes, or a real variety of airplanes, and they were uh, um, all over, uh, uh, particularly western, uh, uh, western northern Quebec and the interior of Labrador. Not too much on the coast of Labrador, but in the interior of Labrador. Um, also a little bit in Ontario and the states, but uh, our bread and butter was uh, was was in Quebec and, and Labrador. Uh, so running about uh, 20 varied machines. A lot of them were from bases that uh, were a one-man show. So you had to make sure that uh, that these folks knew what they were doing. So unlike many bush companies, uh, uh, Laurentian did a lot of training, and it was good training. And uh, they had good maintenance, good training, uh, and, uh, and 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 good personnel. When you and I were talking earlier, you were asking me about the operations triangle. When I worked uh, on fires, and uh, uh, one of the early things that you learn is, is there's a fire triangle. And the fire triangle, a fire to uh, be sustained, uh, it, uh, it needs uh, oxygen, heat, and fuel. And if you take any one side of that uh, away from the, uh, from, uh, from the equation, you can't have a fire. Well, a successful air operation has to have the right personnel. And uh, the right personnel is uh, is is not only the, the the pilots and maintenance engineers, but the but the right uh, management with the uh, with the uh, with the right attitude. You have to have good maintenance. Without good maintenance, uh, you're 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 lost. Um, and you have to have the you have to have the the right airplanes. Uh, and uh, the right airplanes and properly maintained. Trying to do the job with the with the wrong airplane, um, it, it, that doesn't work. So if you break any one side of that triangle by not having the right personnel, uh, the uh, uh, the right airplane and and good maintenance, break any one side of that, and uh, it it's not a successful operation, and it's probably not a safe operation. And uh, so that's uh, that's that's really important, and that's important. That's an important lesson for young people that are coming into the uh, into the industry, whether it's in GA or whether it's in uh, in uh, in uh, uh, air taxis or, or helicopters or, or or large commercial airplanes. That holds true right uh, right through the uh, right through the whole industry. Something to look at look at when you're. You're going for an interview, but you're also looking at the company you're going to get interviewed at, and whether well, they have that culture installed. So. And that's something, again, you and I talked about earlier, uh, later on, uh, uh, to, to talk about young people coming into the industry. Um, I remember uh, going out in, uh, in 1999 and, uh, and, and doing the, uh, uh, the, the commencement speech for the University of the Fraser Valley, their their graduating class, and I talked about this uh, this triangle and uh, where these young people, uh, super young people, were going to go in the future. And you have to be true to yourself, and you have to be true to the people that you're going to have in the in the back of an airplane. And whether it's uh, it's it's yourself, uh, your family, 
or paying passengers, you've got to be you got to be true to yourself that, and be professional, and you be professional all the way down the, down the road. Uh, saying that's uh, that's good enough is sometimes that that has to have been done, and it was done in the, in the, in the bad old days. But uh, being professional is important. Whether you're a, a, a pilot with 50 hours or a, or a pilot with uh, five or ten thousand hours, mm. um, so I, you hear stories of bush flying back in the day, and there's a lot of pushing pushing the limits and pushing the weather and dealing with cold, and um, I'm sure you experienced plenty of that. Um, do you feel? Do you look back on those years with fondness or? feel kind of relief that you survived it well it's a it's a sweet and sour question uh, that's that's where I learned my trade uh, and uh, uh, there are so many fond memories on on it but the uh, uh, particularly in in uh, in northern Quebec and Labrador uh, particularly in the fall time when uh, you have uh, uh, Hudson's Bay uh, Ocean on the to the west, uh, the uh, on Gava Bay and the Arctic Ocean to the to the north, and uh, the Atlantic Ocean to the east. And you're you're in the middle of this, and it's a it's a giant weather mixing area mm. that uh, that just generates bad weather. And if you didn't fly in bad weather, uh, uh, you didn't get the job done. And and so. Uh, and the uh, 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 pushing limits and, and flying in low visibility and at, uh, at, at very low level, uh, it became the, the norm. And uh, uh, it, uh, uh, surviving that is, a, is a, uh, there's, there's a lot of skill, but there's, there's luck as well. And there's a lot of folks that, uh, that, uh, that, that didn't make it, and there's folks that still don't make it. And uh, yeah. it, uh, it, that's why it is so important to be professional, to be able to say and to be able to say no, and to be able to be true to yourself and to your, uh, and to your passengers. So, yes, there's, there's good, and, uh, there, there's good and, and bad memories with it. And uh, flying close to gross, well, cl close to gross is a term. It's hard to say which side of close to gross you're on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so speaking of fond memories, I'm sure flying the beaver and the otter and things were, were special back then. You flew serial number one of the beaver, which um, nowadays <clears throat> number one would never see the light of day in a commercial operation. It would be a prototype. It would probably get tested and then just benched. But you were flying the prototype essentially in the bush. And you, you, in the book, you talk about how it was a little different than the others. Yeah, I was. Uh, it was my second year of flying floats. I was working on a Park Lever Andre in uh, western uh, Western Quebec, and I had a, a, a nice Laurentian uh, Beaver for the first part of the summer. And a contract came up where they needed a reliable airplane further north, and they leased this uh, this old airplane. And it was an old airplane then. Uh, I think then it had probably had around twelve or thirteen thousand hours, something like that, on it. And it was uh, it was well worn. It had been used by uh, Pacific Western Airlines uh, here on the on the west coast, and uh, it was owned by a leasing company in Calgary. And we uh, Laurentian leased it. <clears throat> had a great paint job, looked good, but uh, it uh, I wasn't very happy about getting this old uh, this old clunker, but. Uh, I flew it for the rest of the summer, and I put about 400 hours on it. I, I flew it on wheels back to Calgary, my my first time flying across the country and uh, and and uh, flying on the prairies, flying on the prairies. Holy mackerel! There's no lakes. You're never going to be able to find anything, you know. <laughs> but uh, I had a lot of experiences in that airplane, and it uh, it looked after me uh, after me well. Uh, I wrote a recent story about being in an armed confrontation with it. That was in the Canadian Aviator, uh, in the uh, in the uh, in a book. I've written a book, and, and in the book, there's a, there's a story about FHB, and uh, it uh, uh, it's about the lady that fell out of the airplane. That was the first time I went to court. Uh, that's a good story too, but. Uh, <laughs> 
it's uh, it's now in the museum in Ottawa, and uh, uh, no no trip to Ottawa is is uh, is complete without going to the uh, going to the museum and wandering over and giving the old girl a little pat. It's, so, uh, so tell me more cool. about the armed the armed conflict. <laughs> <laughs> what was what was going on there? Uh, well, I was in the park and uh, we were working a moose hunt and we were really busy. And uh, the game wardens came along and uh, and they said uh, we're commandeering you for the for the for the rest of the day. And uh, that didn't go over very well. And they used to do that in those uh, days uh, uh, quite often, uh, either fighting fires or something like game wardens. So. Uh, you could hunt in the park and you could hunt outside the park, but you had to have special permission to hunt in the park. So there was a, a, a long, narrow lake that uh, uh, that we flew over to, to on the edge of the park. And there was a cut line in the, uh, through the bush, uh, a three meter cut line. And uh, there was a canoe tied up there uh, with a board motor on it. And uh, game wardens directed me over to there, and I nosed into the into the bush and into the cut line. There was no wind, so I could get into the trees. And uh, the uh, game wardens went off and into the park side of the of the bush, and uh, they were there for uh, had gone for quite a while. And I'm kind of uh, uh, Wondering, gee, all this work I got to do back at the at the at the base, and uh, they got me out here. Eventually, they come back out of the bush, and of course, this is all in French, and my French is is pretty basic. Um, but you didn't have to tell that there was a pretty good argument that was going on. And these two game wardens come out, and they're wearing sidearms. They probably got something like a thirty-eight on their hip and a, a little pea shooter type thing. And these two hunters come out with high-powered rifles. I'm standing on the front of the float, and the uh, the, uh, the the two uh, game wardens have got their uh, their back to me, and uh, things get going in pretty rapid fire French, and uh, and uh, there's an obvious demand that the game wardens want these guys' guns, and uh, they're not going to give them up, and they ram around home in the in the chambers of their of their rifles and hold them at the ready. Two game wardens have got their hands on the butts of their pistols, standing right in front of me. And I've got nowhere to go, jump in the water. <laughs> so this got to be pretty heated, and uh, eventually these guys sidle off, get in the canoe, and uh, and, and motor across the, the lake to where their camp was on the other side of the lake, outside of the park. And the game wardens uh, get in. Uh, uh, they they say, okay. Let's get in the airplane, follow that canoe. So I, I taxi across the lake. This time I, 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 uh, I tied up quite a piece down the lake uh, and uh, game wardens went over into the, into the camp and eventually they came back with the, with the rifles. But uh, I, I don't know what, the, what the, uh, the outcome of it finally was, whether these guys were fined or whatever, but uh, they came back with the rifles and I thought, wow. <laughs> What a way to make a living, and I think I nearly got shot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, crazy. Yeah, um, yeah. I guess we should talk about your book a little bit. We kind of launched into this conversation, but the whole reason this came about was I read your book, uh, "Tight Floats and Tailwinds," which is kind of your your memoir, full of stories. And yeah, it's a it's a great read. And I guess what what had sparked it to for you to write that? Well. Um... Uh, you're a COPA director, and uh, I was too up until for, for about six years, 2010 till 2016. And I started writing articles uh, for the uh, for the COPA magazine, and I had a lot of really good feedback uh, out of that. I did a, a lot of technical writing later on in my career, so I've, I've done a lot of writing. But writing for, for entertainment or to tell my story, it, it became something that I really uh, that I really wanted to do. So um, yeah, I wrote a, a, a book uh, for, for years. Uh, I used, I always signed myself off as, as tight floats and tailwinds. And what that is, it's the old bush pilot's blessing of may you have tight floats and tailwinds. If you're a, if you're a, a, a float plane pilot and, uh, and you got leaky floats, Life is a real misery. You, every time you stop, you're, you're, you're pumping floats and you're wet and you're cold and everything else. And if you're on fuel hauls, uh, uh, you know, at uh, 
two and a half hours out and two and a half hours back or something, and you're paddling headwinds and, and turbulence and all that stuff. Life is a life is a misery. So to uh, to have uh, to have tight floats that don't leak and uh, and to have a following tailwind, that's a blessing for a bush pilot. So that that's how it uh, it it got its name. The original name was going to be um, uh, was was going to be uh, uh, bush pilot to bureaucrat and back, but I I, I chose the other one. Uh, and it uh, it tells my story of uh, of, of a lot of uh, bush work uh, to, to start with. Um, uh, uh, cold, a lot of winter flying uh, on skis, uh, really working the subarctic, uh, uh, and uh, both on floats, uh, going out to the Labrador coast. You go to the Labrador coast for the first time as a kid, uh, being uh, uh, being uh, uh, 24 years old, and uh, you know uh, we're here in BC and we, we got mountains, but there's some pretty good mountains back there too. They're they're five thousand uh, five thousand feet at uh, Kangalak Sior back, and uh, it goes straight up. There's no trees. It looks like it's on the moon. Uh, you go over there in July and there's pack ice and uh, uh, and, and icebergs in, uh, in in July and try and find a place to to land, and you're uh, you're in a big old single otter and. Uh, that's uh, that's maybe close to gross and uh, carrying a canoe and all that sort of stuff and uh, it uh, it's pretty intimidating for a uh, for an Ontario farm boy to be out there saying holy mackerel I'm just about at the tip of North America the mainland North America and uh, all everything rests on this one big old round engine running and if it coughs we're in for a world of hurt man <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so it uh, quite a learning thing. But it, it it was uh, it was all of that stuff. Um, eventually, uh, eventually, I I, I decided uh, I wanted to move on a bit. And uh, at that time, most of my time was in De Havilland airplanes, and the Ontario or the federal government was uh, was starting up uh, uh, the Stoll demonstration program. Uh, they owned uh, De Havilland Canada at that time. It was uh, it was uh, later uh, uh, bought out by Boeing, and then it, it moved on and did other things. But they were building the Dash Seven, uh, which was uh, the only true stole airliner that was made. The Dash Eight came along later, but the Dash Eight's not a. It's a great airplane, but it's not a stole airplane. And so what they did is they uh, they modified twin otters uh, and they put spoilers on them. Uh, they uh, uh, they put anti skid brake systems on them, uh, uh, different electrical system, fire system, everything else. And they were operated to the same standards of uh, FAR twenty five uh, in the United States, uh, the airline standards. They built a stall port uh, in downtown uh, Montreal that. Uh, uh, it was an old Expo uh, 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 67 parking lot, and uh, they they built a, a 2,000 foot runway and uh, and had a tower and a, a terminal and everything else, and it was just minutes from uh, from downtown Montreal. In Ottawa, they used excuse me, they used the uh, the old Rockcliffe uh, military airdrome, and they they painted off uh, 2,000 feet on it. Now, two thousand feet for a twin otter uh, is wow. That's a lot of room, but not if you operate it to uh, to airline standards. And that means that uh, that you can uh, uh, you can uh, start your takeoff roll, uh, lose a, an engine at a critical time, and you can still stop on the runway. And uh, in in most stall operations, if something quits, uh, you. you you just accept that, and you're in a world of hurt. It's kind of like flying a single-engine airplane. Uh, this airplane had a six. Uh, this operation had a six-degree glide path coming in. Uh, it used uh, RNAV, and GPS is very common now, but it wasn't GPS. It was uh, VHF uh, RNAV, and they were all RNAV routes, uh, and they'd be very similar to a GPS route now. Um, and at the time, it was all cutting-edge technology. So, in uh, late 1973, I started uh, into the Stoll program. Um, 
I took a step back. Uh, I, I spent 13 months as a uh, as a first officer, but uh, uh, then moved over into the uh, into the left seat. Uh, uh, it was very much a, a, um, it was Transport Canada, Air Canada, and Air Canada operation. But they used uh, all the captains were all ex-military personnel, so I was the uh, uh, I was the uh, uh, a, uh, the first uh, 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 civil uh, uh, captain with with a background with a civil captain that went uh, that went moved over to it, and it was just a, a wonderful uh, uh, program. Uh, we did sixty six flights a day uh, in and out of uh, out of downtown Montreal. We went right through the middle of the Montreal airport. You didn't talk to anybody. You were you were in this bent piece of pipe. Uh, that uh, uh, we had accuracies of two tenths of a mile to center line and 50 feet off a of profile at all times. So you're basically in this bent piece of pipe that went right through uh, went, went right through Montreal and uh, and and, and, and it just worked great. This all was a lead in to sell Dash Seven airplanes, uh, stole ports, and a whole system to the rest of the world. Uh, after um, uh, a little over a year and a half, uh, they declared it a success and they shut it down, uh, which was very sad. Uh, uh, Canada once again had become a real leader in a in a particular field, and uh, and they, uh, they they shut that down. And as a pure stall system, it uh, there was a, a, a they worked out a Canary Wharf in uh, in uh, in uh, London. Uh, and there was a um, uh, there, there was one other operation to stub runways in uh, in the United States, but basically it uh, uh, it it didn't go as a as a as a pure stall system. Hmm. Um, yeah, I'd that, never heard of that. I'd never heard of that before. Then would have been yeah, pretty it, pretty cool to have little strips in downtown areas. And, yeah, I have a yeah. I have a presentation I do for, uh, on it. Uh, I've got uh, professional uh, video clips that were done to prom promoting it this, at the time, and uh, I've got a bunch of memorabilia that, uh, that 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 all goes with it. The airplanes, uh, I'll tell you about it later. But I, the airplanes, uh, I started uh, flying in uh, nineteen uh, uh, nineteen seventy four, early nineteen seventy four. And uh, I flew uh, several of those airplanes, but uh, one of them I flew for 34 years, same airplane. So that was uh, that was my old rocking chair, and uh, I flew it up until 2008 when I delivered it back to Ottawa uh, from uh, Vancouver as a, uh, to go up for a disposal. But the airplane's still flying. Uh, I think that one's uh, in commercial service uh, out on the East Coast. But they uh, they took a lot of the mods off of it. Uh, they didn't use the spoilers and whatnot. Uh, right. Um, yeah. Cool. Um, so yeah, then after that, um, from what I gather in the book, you moved out to BC, and you kind of engaged a different chapter in your life. The next chapter. <laughs> yeah, that's another whole story. How I ended up out here. <laughs> I ended up to be a single parent, and I had to be home every night, which is pretty tough for a commercial pilot. So mm. uh, that's how I ended up in BC, and uh, uh, I was going to quit flying and uh, uh, and go with Pacific Western Airlines in uh, in simulators, which I did. But the job didn't start until the uh, till the fall. So I took a uh, I, I took a seasonal job with uh, with Air West Airlines. Who were running? Uh, uh, it, it was the, the forerunner of, uh, of Harbor Air now, and, and some of the other Air, West Coast Air, and some of the other ones that that, that operated uh, uh, West Coast were were in hot competition with uh, with Air West, but uh, they uh, they ran uh, to uh, Twin Otters to the uh, to Victoria Harbor and Nanaimo Harbor and charters up the coast. So all of this, uh, the, uh, I had uh, I had a lot of float experience, and uh, I had IFR experience, I had twin otter experience. So I uh, I came out here and and operated uh, 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 between the harbors, and uh, and that was uh, uh, everything's always a, a learning process, uh, and uh, again that was uh, that was a learning uh, learning process out here. Uh, from there, I, I did go to uh, uh, Pacific Western uh, Airlines uh, in uh, in the fall. I uh, 
they were a little dragging their feet a little bit. They had a new simulator, 737 simulator coming online. And uh, uh, so I said, hey, uh, I've got to take uh, uh, got to take the job uh, as chief pilot of, uh, of Air West Airlines or else I get furloughed because I'm not part of the, I haven't got the seniority on the union. And I really didn't want to be chief pilot for Air West. So right. uh, uh, I went to PWA. Uh, the largest airplanes I'd previously flown were DC-3s on wheels and skis. And, um, and now all of a sudden, uh, through I, I end up uh, as an instructor on jet airplanes. And uh, uh, and uh, I had to digest the, uh, the Boeing 707. So I, I, I checked out as a uh, Boeing 707 uh, simulator uh, instructor. Uh, I was pretty... I was pretty proud of, of digesting that uh, of digesting that one. That was a was a lot of study and a lot of a lot of work. But about the same time, those uh, the the six modified twin otters that were with uh, Air Transit that uh, the, the stole operation, each Transport Canada uh, region across the country. Uh, inherited one of those uh, one of those modified airplanes, and that was my segue into uh, into Transport Canada. In that, uh, when uh, when they got the airplane at Vancouver, and there was a lot of different systems on it, and they found out that there was uh, someone on the field that had been flying them recently. Uh, that's how I first sort of met the people at uh, at, at Transport, and uh, uh, and that led to. Uh, that led to, to, to going into transport for the next uh, next 31 years. And, wow. uh, yeah. So you've had a lot of roles at Transport Canada, um, working your way up the ladder, and um, you've managed to keep flying through a lot of those years too. Um, take me on a bit of a whirlwind tour through your, your Transport Canada roles. <clears throat> Transport Canada. Okay, so I started off in air regulations, uh, and air regulations was uh, kind of an omnibus of doing a lot of things. I, I was uh, specifically a um, uh, an instrument standards uh, inspector doing instrument rides out of Vancouver, and in those days you had to do a ride every six months uh, for a class one. There were class two instrument. Uh, 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 tickets at that time. Uh, I think that was a good system. But uh, anyway, so it, there was a lot of work doing uh, instrument rides and proficiency checks. There wasn't a small air carrier uh, section at that time. So we did uh, air carrier uh, uh, air carrier work uh, as well with the with the small airlines. Uh, uh, and uh, there was uh, one of the things that had happened was is that uh, there were in Transport Canada uh, DOT. Uh, there were a lot of wartime vets that were still in transport at that time. Uh, it was very heavily to uh, to ex-military folks. Uh, there was a smattering of uh, of ex-RCMP Air Division. Uh, and then there were uh, there were quite a few instructors, uh, folks that uh, that uh, that were instructors. So that was the that was the mainstay of the uh, of the uh, of the backgrounds of the, of the people that were in there, and uh, a lot of a lot of really good uh, folks, but a lot of folks that didn't have the background of operating in a in a small uh, in small uh, commercial operations and, and bush operations. Mm. So I had a little bit of an edge on that. Uh, the other thing was that. Uh, uh, I was an Easterner, and uh, I wasn't uh, uh, I wasn't an insider, and and so I just called a spade a spade, and so I wasn't a very popular guy sometimes. But uh, uh, at that time, uh, there were the float operations were were a lot bigger than they are now. Uh, there wasn't as many uh, land strips. There were uh, Ocean Falls was uh, was gone. There was uh, thirty five hundred to town of thirty five hundred people that was served almost exclusively by uh, by airplanes, as were all the logging camps up there, and the accident rate on the coast was really really high. Uh, mm -hmm. There was uh, and sometimes there there was a fatal accident in a month for a while in those times, and and so uh, it uh, oversight. 
to uh, to, to to look at the uh, at, at the industry was needed. Uh, the Dubin inquiry was conducted in 1979 and uh, published in 1983. Ten years later, that was followed up by, by the Moshansky uh, uh, Air Safety uh, um, uh, Commission and. Uh, they found that Transport Canada was seriously lacking in the oversight that they were providing. It it was the it was the wild west, and uh, and so I think things I think things uh, became a lot safer as a result of those uh, two safety inquiries, and they started to bring in more people that did have a commercial background and and could go out and say, hey, this is not reasonable. You know, fun's fun, but uh, wow. It, uh, to, uh, to to push some of the weather, to have some of the loads, to, to, to have some of the maintenance practices that were there, uh, it, some of it was uh, was was pretty concerning, and and that was uh, um, that was revealed in the in the very high accident rates. When you moved on to enforcement and things like that, you kind of had an edge. There's a couple of stories in the book where you got one up on the operators because you knew their secrets <laughs> that they were they were going to do. <laughs> Well, enforcement didn't come along till uh, till later. There was always an enforcement uh, 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 component of it all. Uh, after uh, after two years in air eggs of uh, of doing rides and, and air carrier work, uh, I, I spent the next uh, uh, eight and a half years in airdrome inspection, and so. Uh, uh, that was uh, out. Uh, that was more a white hat job. I, I, I loved that job. That was my favorite job in, in transport, and that you're out inspecting uh, uh, facilities. And um, uh, uh, for instance, there uh, in in the early '80s, uh, there was a, a, a bonanza that uh, that he ditched at uh, Namu. Uh, a, a floating uh, a camp on the uh, on the mid coast because there was nothing on the charts. Uh, there were there were no airstrips. There there was nothing on the charts. It just showed as as wilderness pretty well. And um, in reality, there was a, there was a lot of logging strips uh, on the on the on the coast, and um, uh, and seaplane bases and lighthouses and things that weren't there. So. Uh, this uh, this American uh, uh, he saw some sign of life and he got himself in some sort of difficulty so he uh, he uh, he ditched in the in the water. In reality, there was about within a, within forty or fifty miles there was, there was about three airstrips. They were pretty demanding uh, bush type strips, but they were uh, um, uh, they were at least a flat place to crash and there was people there. And uh, so, uh, one of the things that, that I did was a was a program that uh, where I charted uh, all of these bush strips and put them in, and that uh, meant either taking uh, an amphib beaver or the or the twin otter into all of these uh, all of these strips and uh, and charting them and, uh, and putting them on the uh, on the, on the uh, on the charts. If you're Work in a local area, and you're into one of those strips all the time. You know all the big, uh, all the, uh, the 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 ins and outs of it. But if you're going there for the first time, boy, you got to be pretty careful and have a bit of a background of getting in there. <laughs> uh, they they were pretty demanding. The other thing that the uh, the transport did at that time uh, with all the seaplane operations, there were 64 seaplane bases that were owned by Transport Canada in the in the province. And um, I took over that program, and so I had to visit uh, all the seaplane sites and uh, and uh, see that they were in good shape, and the tugboats hadn't run over them, and fishermen hadn't taken over, and they weren't throwing beer bottles at you, and all that stuff. And uh, it uh, it was just a really interesting. Uh, at that time, Transport Canada owned um, most of the uh, of, of the. Uh, the big airports and many of the secondary airports in all of Canada. So uh, uh, all of those airports had to be inspected. All the nav aids had to be inspected. Uh, they eventually got turned over to uh, uh, to Nav Canada. I think in 90, 1996, I think they uh, they went over. But uh, it was a huge infrastructure to go out and administer, and uh, and it was just great. 
uh, a lot of the Air Force personnel that were there, uh, they weren't very interested in, uh, in, uh, in gravel, in, in seaplanes or in helicopters. So uh, they said, hey, throw me in, coach. And, uh, and, and I just had a wonderful time. Boy, there's not many places in this province that I haven't been, I'll tell you. Yeah, that's it, amazing. It was just great. Um, from there, uh, uh, I went back to Air Carrier for a little while. Uh, Doing audits and, uh, and and doing uh, doing manuals and all that stuff. That's uh, it's necessary, but it, uh, it, it it didn't pull my chain too much. So uh, enforcement came along and they said, "Hey, Cole, how would you like to come over and work in our shop?" So I said, "Okay," uh, and uh, I went there and I spent the next nine years there. Uh, uh, half of it as uh, 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 as a, as an inspector, as a as a superintendent, and finally as the uh, as the manager, uh, and I know particularly in the GA community, there's a, there's a lot of angst with uh, with enforcement, and I can only speak for what it was during the time that that, that I was there, but it was probably the most professionally. Uh, operated uh, portion of transport uh, that uh, that I operated in in my 31 years, and the reason for that is 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 that every final decision that's made is you've got to expect that that decision is going to go to court, or uh, and uh, and eventually they they develop the tribunal. Uh, that someone else is going to look at this from a from a from a judicial point of uh, third party view. And so the training in there was uh, was uh, was uh, was higher than a lot of the uh, other sections, uh, and uh, the managers that uh, that uh, were there when I when I went in, uh, they were very reasonable. And if it was something, uh, if it was uh, if it was something that was unintentional, uh, or uh, or it was a one off and a and a slip in judgment, quite often. It was dealt with uh, it, what was called a, a, an oral counseling, and uh, but if somebody took an airplane out, a young lad took an airplane out, and he went and beat up his girlfriend's house at uh, at zip feet or something like that, or it was a commercial uh, carrier that uh, grossly overloaded an airplane, or it used bogus parts, or uh, or didn't maintain the uh, the airplanes pro uh, properly. Uh, then that then that was taken to the uh, to the full measure of the of the law, but it was done in a in a professional manner, and uh, I was uh, uh, I was proud of the way they operated and what uh, they added to aviation safety in Canada. And coming from a background of mine, that, you know, when I was a young lad, I used to show people how to break the regulations, uh, you know. Want to learn to fly overloaded airplanes? Well, then you better learn how to fly them right. Uh, it was that type of thing many years ago, and that was the bad old days, really. And but to take that experience and to be able to push it on to try and keep some of these young people alive and uh, provide passengers with a with a with safer transportation, uh, it, it, that was a that was a good thing to do. From there, I uh, I moved on uh, uh, to uh, air carrier, which became commercial and business aviation, uh, and uh, I took over as the uh, uh, as the manager there. Uh, we had uh, around 280 air carriers in in Canada, or in in the Pacific region, uh, and that was uh, uh, that was about. Uh, just shy of 200 fixed wing carriers and and 80 some helicopter operators. Uh, British Columbia is responsible for about 20 percent of the aviation activity in uh, in in Canada, and because of the terrain and uh, you know if, if you want to fly to Kamloops you know, even uh, even on a little airplane you could be in Kamloops in just a, a little over an hour in, in a 172. Well, if you jump in your car and go up there, you're looking at a at a four or five hour drive. So uh, the uh, that plus the coastal operations make uh, uh, British Columbia a, a, a really aviation oriented uh, uh, community. Um, I took a little hiatus uh, uh, when I was with uh, with their carrier and uh, went to. Uh, 
I worked for Harbors and Ports on a special project. It was supposed to be for, uh, for a year and it ended up to be two, and it was Victoria Harbor. Victoria Harbor is one of the most interesting airports anywhere, bar none. If you take some of the highest priced real estate uh, in Canada, that, uh, that's in uh, uh, high density condominiums and hotels in the legislature of the province, immediately adjacent to the uh, landing and takeoff area, you have about 400 resident vessels uh, you have uh, that run from uh, uh, that run from uh, 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 water taxis to tugboats and barges to uh, huge ferries and uh, uh, and all of the and, and kids on paddle boards and then you operate commercial airplanes into it uh, and helicopters uh, on a regular basis. Uh, boy, it's got to be a ballet that you have to uh, 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 orchestrate and, and carry out with with great precision. And the people that uh, that uh, that operate the harbor and the people that operate in and out of the harbor, boy, they have to be commended. Uh, I, I highly recommend that somebody go down on a uh, on a uh, on a busy morning. Uh, Weekday morning in Victoria Harbor, uh, or around the around the noon hour, or around four o'clock, and just watch the ballet that takes place. And all of that had to be orchestrated. Uh, there was a, a risk management study that was done. I helped to manage that uh, uh, for uh, uh, for uh, uh, over a year. And uh, I, in 1979, I I'd instit to help institute some of the procedures into the harbor. And um, back in, uh, in in 2000, nearly 20 years later, I was uh, I was I was back refining some of those things. So it, it was a it was just a great hands-on, good worthwhile project to to, to do. Following yeah. that, I went following that I went back to air carrier for uh, for a little while, commercial and business aviation, and uh, uh, and then out of the blue, uh, the um, uh, uh, Aircraft services uh, approached me and asked me if I'd go back out to the uh, uh, out to the airport and operate the transport uh, fleet of airplanes, and um, and uh, we also operated the two Coast Guard heliports uh, uh, helicopter operations in Prince Rupert and uh, and in Victoria. So uh, I went back to being at the uh, at the pointy end of the stick again, and uh, and flying and providing services uh, for internally and for other government agencies, and uh, and that was a, a great run until uh, I spent five years there until I retired in uh, in two thousand and eight. So that was Transport Canada. Yeah, and I think going back to the Victoria Harbor. It's like an iceberg. You see the the tip of it, but there's so much going on behind the scenes to make that work. Make sure you don't land out of the box and <laughs> things like that. It's it's quite the system. Yeah. It really it really is, and uh, I'm really proud to have been part of that. Um, <clears throat> I had I I did a lot of uh, of uh, uh, of writing standards uh, at one time, uh, helping to write standards. They sent me back to Ottawa, and, and I did that. So I helped uh, write standards for uh, uh, for heliports, uh, for stole ports, and uh, I, I did the drafts for the water ice uh, airports. And uh, that eventually, it still hasn't been uh, it still hasn't been put into law. But there's a it's a draft that's there, and. Um, the Victoria Harbor is sort of as a certified airport to a draft standard that is very similar to land airport standards, and uh, I was really proud of being part of that. It's it really something. Awesome. So then, you retire, um, and and you you mentioned it before, but you, you one of your final things you did was you flew the Twin Otter back to Ottawa. So it was almost like taking yourself back to your roots. But you have a story about. Um, you have your 172, and you wanted to recreate a journey across the country. So tell me a little bit about the inspiration behind that. Well, I didn't want to. I didn't want to quit. Uh, I, I didn't want to quit flying when I uh, when I retired. So the first thing I did just before I retired, I bought into an old Champ uh, out at uh, uh, out at Delta Air Park, and uh, with I was in partnership with some other guys that didn't have a starter or anything. You had to flip it all the time, and she was back to grassroots. 
Nearly all of my career uh, was with the uh, commercial or with government operations, and I had very little to do with the, with the GA side of things. But going out to Delta Air Park, getting into that champ, boy, I met some really nice people. They paid for their own gas. That's a big difference. <laughs> and uh, and I met some really great uh, great people, and uh, uh, that led to buying a 172. Uh, I like Canadian history. And one of the things that uh, uh, I, I'd been back in Kingston, Ontario with a friend of mine, uh, and he went to church with a, uh, a retired um, McGill professor. And uh, in 1989, this McGill professor started out with a canoe by himself. And he, was, uh, uh, he liked uh, Scottish Canadian history. And uh, one of the most uh, famous uh, Scots uh, in Canadian history is Sir Alexander Mackenzie, the first person to uh, cross North America, uh, uh, north of uh, north of Mexico. Uh, and he, uh, that was in 1793 that he came out to uh, to Bella Coola. And so in 1989, uh, this. Uh, uh, this fellow, uh, this retired professor, started out in a canoe, and it took him four years to paddle the canoe routes, the <laughs> Voyager canoe routes, all across Canada to arrive in time for the 22nd of July uh, in 1993 to celebrate the, uh, the 200th anniversary of Mackenzie going across the country. So I read this book, and I thought, geez, you know, uh, I'd just love to do that, but I'm sure as hell not going to do it in a canoe. Uh, so... Uh, I'm going to do it in a little air with low level in a little airplane. So in 2000 and, uh, in 2008, uh, I retired in April 2008, and uh, in uh, late May, my wife and I we headed out and we went down to the uh, we went down to the east coast and puttered around a bit. I came back to uh, uh, I came back to uh, Kingston, and she flew home commercial, and my friend uh, and I. We went back to Montreal to the Fur Museum at Lachine, where uh, all of this started out uh, in every May, the, the big uh, Voyager flotillas. Uh, the bonus on this was that it was uh, not only the 215th anniversary of uh, Mackenzie's uh, uh, going across the country, but it was the 200th anniversary of Simon Fraser getting to the mouth of the Fraser River. So we visited Simon Fraser's grave in St. Andrew's West, uh, went to Montreal, and then we started out. And we spent 16 days flying across the country at low level, uh, religiously flying the uh, canoe routes, uh, uh, stopping off at the, all the historic sites. Took a little side trip to Winnipeg, where the, the Winnipeg Provincial Museum has a whole uh, floor that's uh, dedicated to the fur trade in the Hudson's Bay and we just had a, a, a fantastic trip uh, all, all the way up through. People opened up museums for us that weren't open yet. Uh, uh, we went up to, uh, up to Fort Chippewan, uh, to come out the Peace River, and uh, back out through and down into, uh, into Bella Coola, back into Quinnell, and then down the Fraser River to, uh, uh, to commemorate the, uh, the 215th of Mackenzie and the 200th of, uh, of Fraser. And it was, a trip of a, it was a trip of a lifetime. That's the sort of missions that people, I feel, I feel like people don't do as often anymore. Just a mission for the sake of it. Let's go fly. Let's pick a fun mission and go do it. You don't always have to have a, a, a reason to go. Just go do it. Well, the other thing is, if, uh, if and I describe in the book, I made uh, uh, I've made five trans uh, five uh, trips across Canada with the Cessna, and another one uh, halfway across, and I call it going flyabout, and uh, it uh, it it's uh, it takes a, I've, all of them have gone about a month at a time. In two thousand and eighteen, I did most of it solo. Uh, and I went from Hyder, Alaska, and Stewart, Alaska, my own stomping grounds around Rupert and and and, uh, and Terrace. Uh, went all across the country as far as Seven Islands. I was I was headed up to uh, on Gava and Labrador, but it was I, I got there too late. It was in September, so uh, the weather had already gone south. So I went to Cape Breton instead. But going to small town Canada and 
and you don't stay in airport hotels. You, you, it so it costs you a few bucks extra. You go and stay in small town Canada and uh, and and the old part of town. The hotels aren't usually as good as they are up on the highway. But uh, and you you, uh, you you go to the local diner. You meet the taxi driver that. Uh, um, in Dryden, Ontario, that turns their meter off and, and gives you a ride around town and shows you what the Ryden's really like and how proud they are of the community. You talk to uh, you talk to Joe in uh, in, in uh, Lewisburg in, uh, in in Cape Breton. He's fishing for mackerel off the off the dock. And yeah, I've been to uh, been to Fort Mac and all that stuff, but. Uh, Got to come back home to down east, uh, and uh, you, you you go to uh, uh, to Medicine Hat, and you talk to the haberdasher downtown. That uh, him and his father have been in the business for, uh, for for forty or fifty years, and these are real Canadians. And this is what an airplane's meant for. It's not meant just to get up and look out the window. It's meant to go places and and see things. And uh, our country is so wonderful, and uh, and and being able to do it. It's a magic carpet that allows you do it yeah totally amazing so a little bit selfishly i just got voted in as the bc and yukon copa director and i know you spent six plus years at copa as a director as well um so i'm going to selfishly ask advice on the podcast <laughs> um so first off why should people become copa members you've been a member since 1964 your boss and mentor john bogey was the co-founder You've been there from the beginning. Like, why is COPA an important organization? Our aviation community, in many ways, is is fragile, particularly the GA part of it. Uh, uh, the uh, The Helicopter Association of Canada looks after the commercial helicopter guys. ATAC uh, Air Transport Association of Canada looks after the uh, the commercial guys. The uh, airports uh, have a they have an organization. And they all uh, they all lobby uh, they all lobby government and they look out for for their uh, their part of it. Canadian Business Aircraft Association looks after the uh, after the, after the corporate guys. Who looks after the guy with the with with the, with the with the one seventy two or the champ or uh, uh, or owns his own uh, owns his own airstrip or uh, he. Uh, uh, the person that gets into medical problems, the the person that get, runs afoul of uh, of uh, of transport and gets himself into difficulties, do you look after that by yourself, or do you have somebody that looks after it that helps and and you can draw on the expertise of other people to do that? And that organization in Canada and why it was uh, why it was found by uh, John Bogey and Margaret Carson. Uh, is the Canadian Owners and Pilots Association. And uh, it is so important to have a voice that, uh, that, 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 uh, that the little guy can go to. And a lot of the, uh, a, a lot of the, the freedoms that we have in Canada to, to fly and to do things that, that they can't do in Europe and, and, and other places where things are so heavily regulated, a lot of the things that we're able to do have been uh, have been been fought for with uh, with with COPA, and sometimes has the COPA been at loggerheads with uh, with Transport Canada? Yes, they have, uh, and with the legislators, and and rightfully so. Um, in recent years, uh, there's been more of a push to be collaborative with the transport, and and that's great. And working in a collaborative way is is really good, but sometimes. People have to dig their heels in and, and, and look out for the little guy. And that's the, uh, that's the job of, uh, of, of uh, Canadian Owners and, and Pilots Association. And, uh, uh, by the way, I, I, I'm currently a director for the, for the BC Aviation Council. And that's, a, that's another story, and I'll talk about that in, in a little bit. But with COPA, the... Uh, the, the role of, uh, of directors is, is really important. Uh, yes, you provide governance for the organization, and uh, yes, you have uh, a president and CEO that does all of the uh, the day-to-day -day legwork. Uh, there has been a, uh, uh, 
a, um, a move in, in recent years to centralize everything out of Ottawa. This is too big a, company, a country and it's, uh, it's too big. Uh, uh, there are too many people are out there for, for several people in Ottawa to be, to, to, to be out there and everywhere. Um, I don't know what the number is right now, but in 2016, there were 23 COPA flights or chapters in, uh, in British Columbia. Most of them are flying clubs that are uh, that are, are that are also uh, a COPA flight, uh, and some of the uh, uh, examples of that are the the, uh, the uh, BC Float Plane Association, uh, uh, the Aero Club of, uh, of BC, the oldest uh, Aero Club in uh, in uh, existing Aero Club in the uh, uh, in the British Commonwealth. Uh, Boundary Bay Flying Club, uh, the Kelowna Flying Club, Vernon, all of these, uh, all of these places. And so, what what needs to happen is, uh, you ask you personally, what uh, what should you be doing? You should be becoming a member of as many of these organizations as you can. I think you're the president of the Squamish uh, 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 Flying Club. Yeah. But become a member of these other ones, and even if you don't become a member. Uh, get on their mailing lists and get out. Uh, COVID makes it really difficult right now, but you can do it via Zoom and whatever. Uh, uh, via the, 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 the uh, BCGA, the BC General Aviation Association, Ryan Van Heren and his, uh, and his group, what they've done is, uh, is just fantastic. They've appealed to the young people by going through Facebook and going virtual and, and getting a huge following there. But Getting out there, being seen, get, making the personal contacts, getting to know people's stories, getting out, seeing what's happening at the various airports. Airports right now are really under fire. Uh, the, with the shutdown of the industry, and, and a lot of them are struggling to start with, uh, a real uh, um, success story right now is golden. Yeah. And uh, Golden recently became uh, under fire. The, uh, the municipality uh, uh, commenced a study as do we continue operating our airport or uh, can we turn it into condos and sell it to rich Calgarians? Uh, is, it, is it better put to use there? And through a coalition of all of the uh, of, of the of the groups, and 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 it, it there's not except for the helicopter folks, there's not any real commercial operation there. So this is GA that is coming forward, and it's COPA, and it's the BC Aviation Council, and it's the BCGA, and it's the other clubs, all the people that came forward and said, hey. This is a this is an important resource to your community. It's a and it's not only just to your community. It's on major flyways east west from uh, from Calgary through to the coast, from uh, Montana through to uh, headed uh, headed up the Rocky Mountain Trench, and and this type of of, uh, of of lobby and representation. If you go in there as an individual and say, hey, I think the, the Golden Airport uh, is, is, uh, uh, is, is a really valuable resource. Well, okay, that's a big deal. But if you can say that you have got, uh, I think COPE is running around 14,000 members right now. You say, hey, we got 14,000 people behind us. We're the, the largest aviation organization in, in Canada. If the... Uh, if the uh, uh, BCGA can say, hey, we're a big COPA flight and we've got 2,500 members uh, that are here. If you can go to the, uh, to the um, uh, BC Aviation Council, uh, and the BC Aviation Council is focused on, uh, on, on provincial and they have good, good provincial ties. That's what, where COPA, COPA has the national ties to Transport Canada and some of the purse strings there, but they don't have, COPA doesn't uh, go into the individual, uh, uh, indiv individual provinces as much as I think they should be. And so this is where the value of these organizations are. Uh, the role that you have just taken on as a, as a COPA director is, uh, is really important. Copa is in a bit of a transition right now. You have a new leader, and the support that you can give her by uh, bringing the grassroots out of British Columbia to her is so so important. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. My my plan is to do a tour next spring of 
trying to hit all the the Copa flights and meet people and re-engage people. You bet. So, yeah. Awesome. So you flew Beaver number one. Um, and last year you got to go see Greg at Harbor Air fly the electric Beaver. So it's kind of a almost a neat bookend on your career. Um, you've seen and done a lot of flying in between. What advice would you have for young pilots who are trying to start a career in aviation? Um, or perhaps have romantic visions of bush flying and um, where, where do you think we're going and what should they be looking at? What should they be looking at? I wish I could do it all again. Man, I would yeah. just love to do it again. <laughs> but uh, uh, right now we're in a COVID time. There's a lot of layoffs and, uh, and, and I have a friend, a previous uh, a director, a previous president of, uh, of, uh, uh, Canadian Owners and Pilots Association, Kevin Sutka. He's uh, he's working for the Airline Pilots Association, um, and um, uh, he was he and I were talking recently, and he he said that uh, you know, boy, we were looking at uh, sh pilot shortages and uh, and 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 duty days and and all of the pressures that were on the industry for uh, uh, for. Um, uh, uh, how do we get people into into the seats and, and and keep things running? And then somebody threw a switch called COVID, and all of a sudden, it's it's the opposite. And uh, and and people are on furlough. And uh, and and what do we do? Uh, students are partway through their through their training, and uh, we're going to have to wait it out. But uh, it is going to get better. And when it comes back, that shortage is going to be there. And I think. It's going to be there even in a bigger time. It may take a year or two, but it's going to be there even bigger than it is now. So getting into the aviation uh, business, my dad used to tell me, you know, if there's a big shortage of, uh, of potatoes this year, uh, uh, next year don't plant potatoes because everybody else is going to plant potatoes. Well, it's kind of like that in the aviation industry right now because uh, it because there, there, there is a shortage, and and it is going to be needed. You need to plant the potatoes right now, because uh, to look forward to the future. To uh, I, I explained that uh, that operations triangle and being true to yourself. I think that is so important. It is uh, if you're going into into into, into bush operations uh, and. In some ways, things haven't changed that much. People have still uh, uh, still got to go out to uh, in, into remote areas. Uh, oversight is not there very much. Uh, it's it's hard to make a dollar, and and so a lot of those pressures are still there. And can we throw a little extra on the uh, on the airplane because uh, it it costs a lot per pound to to get it out there, or geez, you got to push the weather to get this uh, to get this trip done. You've got to be true to yourself, and if it if you if it gets to a point where it doesn't feel right, then you then you then you've got to back off on it, and uh, it's you've got to have that self integrity to 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 be able to not only survive yourself, but uh, you owe it to the to the people that are in the back of airplanes. Um, I think that the opportunities are there. Uh, go for it. Go out uh, and uh, and and pound the areas that uh, that you're looking at. There's uh, so many different genres that you that you can get into, uh, whether it's uh, whether it's charter work, it's uh, um, uh, whether it's uh, it's fire patrol, whether it's pipeline patrol, uh, uh, traffic surveys, whether it's helicopters or whether it's uh, it, it's fixed wing. Uh, just go for it and. Uh, I wish I could be there with you. Well, you're not done flying yet. So what's what's left on your bucket list? What's what do you want to try and check off? What do you want to fly or what do you want to see? Well, this year I wrote this book. So uh, this year uh, I was going to go uh, put boxes of uh, uh, books in my airplane and go pedal them all across the country. <laughs> it's amazing how small this uh, the the aviation community is. I know people all over Canada, mm -hmm. and. I, it's been how many years? It's 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 been fifty years since I was up in the Ungavin Labrador area, and uh, I, I want to go back up there. Things have really changed. 
uh, gas is, uh, is, is a lot harder to, uh, to get up in there. It's uh, longer legs. But um, I, I'd like to go back up into that area and um, uh, I'd like to go over and I'd like to, uh, to jump across to, uh, uh, to Newfoundland. And if you go from, uh, uh, if you go from Blanc to Blanc uh, across, it's about the same as going from here to the, from, uh, from Vancouver to Nanaimo. So it's not that big chunk yeah. of water. And if you get up high enough, uh, uh, a year, uh, two years ago, uh, I jumped across the St. Lawrence at, uh, uh, up near Seven Islands, and it's uh, it's actually wider there. But if you get up to ten thousand five hundred feet and, and uh, yeah, see where the boats are, and you can almost glide to either shore. Well, <laughs> it's, uh, so uh, going to Newfoundland to uh, to Saint Anthony, and you got to say that right if you're a Newf, you got to say Saint Anthony, and it's uh, it's it's only about twenty kilometers to La Anse de Meadows, and La Anse de Meadows is the uh, Viking site uh, of the of the of the uh, first settlement in North America, and that's one of my goals. I want to spend about a month doing that. That'd be What's great. Next? Yeah, awesome. Well, um, hopefully next summer we can do all these things and. Uh, I'll put links to your book in the show notes for this so that people can grab your book. Um, there's tons of stories we haven't even touched on here, like polar bears and 9-11 was an interesting story. You were one of the first planes back in the air for that. And so, um, yeah, I encourage everybody to pick up this book and have a good read about aviation over Christmas. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, the plug is is that uh, it's available through the BC uh, GA on their website, and uh, or you can contact me direct at uh, C O L E W T at smart S M A R T T two T's dot email. And uh, I really appreciate you having me on here and giving me the opportunity to uh, put some old war tales out to some of the young folks, maybe. Yeah, and hopefully we'll catch up with you at Langley or another report soon. You bet. Awesome. Wish you all tight floats and tailwinds. (laughs) There you go. A big thanks to Tim Cole for sitting down and telling us his story. And thanks to you if you've listened all the way through. I hope these full-length episodes are entertaining and worthwhile for you. Fire me a message or an email and let me know. Do you want shorter episodes or do you like the in-depth long format shows? You can reach me on Instagram at Columbia or email me through the website at flyingbc.com. I hope the remainder of 2020 goes smoothly and quickly for everyone. I think I can speak for all of us when we say bring on 2021. Please leave the show a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen, and I look forward to bringing you lots of great shows in the coming months. Fly safe, and we'll see you at the airport.